and go. <laughs> okay, so I want to welcome those of you who are back for part two of our webinar on the five existential questions. So thank you for coming back. Given what happened in Boston today, and I'm not sure everyone is aware of what happened in Boston, but the unaware. double bombing, uh, maybe unaware? Unaware. Uh, is that Lindsay? Barbara. It was Barbara, unaware. Well, there was a, there was a, tr a, either a double or a triple bombing during the Boston Marathon today. Um, oh, yikes. This last I heard, about 45 minutes ago, two people are dead, um, dozens are wounded, some of them horribly wounded. Uh, no one's claimed, again, as far as I know, no one's claimed uh, responsibility, and everything is just sort of up in the air. But it, to me, anyway, it looks clearly like a terrorist attack. But the president came on, he didn't use the word terrorism, so they're all playing it close to the vest before they say anything conclusive. But given that's what happened today, I thought we would start with uh, just a few moments of silence. And then I'm going to say the, um, the end of the, the Kaddish prayer, the prayer that uh, in the synagogue we use uh, to memorialize the dead. And I'll just do the, the last line of that. So if you will, just take a moment and we'll just uh, be, be silent. Say shalom bimrumav. Who ya say shalom aleinu, va kol Yisrael, va kol Yoshei Tevel, bimru amen. May the power that makes for peace throughout the heavens be the power upon which each one of us learns to draw to make for peace in our own lives, in our own world. And we send the merit of our study today to those who are suffering in Boston. Okay. So. And on the one hand, I thought it's very odd to do this webinar when that's going on. And then on the other hand, I thought, no, on the contrary, this makes total sense. I mean, here's the, the, the raw reality of life in the world that we live in, in a very zero-sum world where there's winners and losers and angry people doing harm to one another. Um, I mean, doing harm to, you know, innocence. And, and that's really what we're dealing with, is this, this existential reality and these questions. And my position is, my, my hope is, that if people understood who we are and where we came from and where we're going and how we should live and why, things like this wouldn't happen. So I don't want to go off on a sermon about, about today. We'll learn a lot more about it as uh, the weeks unfold. But I, I just think we, we needed to, to recognize that. So the topic for today is the second of the five questions, where did I come from? So last time, if you remember, the question is, who am I? And the answer is God. Not in that classic, dualistic, theistic sense that God, uh, where God is a being out there in the world somewhere, the judge and the creator, uh, but in the, in, the, in the more mystical sense that all reality is the divine and that uh, we are an expression of the divine. So we're going to take that a little farther. I mean, the first three of these really, who am I, where did I come from, where am I going? The answer is always the same, God, right? And we use the metaphor of the ocean and the wave. So, you know, where, you know who am I, where the ocean, where did I come from, where were the wave arising in that ocean? So we came from the ocean. And where am I going? The wave, wave returns to the ocean. So again, we're the ocean. But in no way do I want to leave anyone with the impression that the wave doesn't matter. On the contrary, the, the wave is unique and distinct. The wave is unrepeatable. The ocean continues to wave, but never waves the same wave twice. So when we talk about where am I going, you know, we'll talk about reincarnation, we'll talk about uh, life after death, but ultimately those aren't my, that's not where I go with this. 
um, I, I don't I don't find either of those positions compelling um, because I think that they make no sense with the ocean wave metaphor. All that I think will become clear as we go along. I wanna, and we're gonna try to get both of those questions done today, tonight. But I wanted to start with this amazing video from Alan Watts. Now, originally these were videos that um, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, the two guys who created South Park, the television show South Park, uh, did by taking Alan Watts audio tape and then illustrating it. This is a version that I had not seen before today. And uh, Kathy and Wendy think it's someone who took the original version and then expanded it somehow. So whatever it is, however it is, it's really well done. And it really sets the tone for what we're going to do. So let's, let's just wanna, it's, it's three minutes and 27 seconds. I'm hoping that you can all see this. Let's just check before I run it. Uh, can everyone see on their screen this appling big black square that says appling in it? Yep, I can see it. Any, oh gosh, that was a stupid question on my part. Anybody not see it? No? Okay, great. Then I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and play this and we can talk about it. What I want to do is have a conversation about this uh, as soon as it's over and then we'll pick up with the slides. So let's, let's just watch this. This is amazing. Okay, I'm, I'm stopping it. Why is oh, it's, there's a delay? I just want can everybody hear it? Yes. Can anyone not hear it? Okay, okay. I guess. Let's try again. Are you moving it? I'm not doing anything now. It's just frozen. No, oh, sorry. That was too bad. Oh. I don't know what it's doing. And every summer, inside a gallery. Now, 
All right. All right. I think I think it's just not going to work. So let, let me just recap what he said so far, and I'm going to see if I can show you stills, uh, if not the actual movie. It, it, this worked perfectly several times today, and now it's not working at all. Uh, okay. So so what he's saying is we have these two possible three actually uh, three possible ideas. One is that the universe is simply stupid and that human consciousness is, he says, an unfortunate accident. I don't know why he adds the word unfortunate. Uh, the people I've read who talk that way don't say unfortunate. Certainly it's unfortunate for us, but it is an accident. And then he gives you the, the either, either somebody's on fire <laughs> or crap. Okay, I, I took it off, so <laughs> sorry about that. That's very annoying. Uh, I would definitely urge you to go YouTube, uh, go, go Google Alan Watts um, South Park videos and you'll find these. So let me just walk you through it. It's, it's very cute. It makes a very important point. Rami, so the, could you email what? a link to us? Uh, a video? Kathy's and, uh, Kathy and Wendy have the link. They can, Mommy, can, can you do that? You. you can't hear me? My, my mic can. is on. I don't know why that's true. I can hear you. I hear you. Uh, well, <laughs> okay. Who does hear? <laughs> Silent. Who doesn't hear? <laughs> no, everybody hears me now. Okay. Let me just double check. Is that yeah? Okay. So let's let's let me try to explain this. And I apologize for that. I thought we were being so clever. Uh, so. What, what we're talking about is, is ways of understanding the universe that we are, that we, that we're a part of. And the classic new atheist version of, of this is that the universe is fundamentally ignorant. It's all random chance. And given billions and billions of years of trial and error, the universe accidentally created consciousness and the consciousness evolved into, into us. Uh, Watts then says, okay, you can look at that as an accident, or you can imagine the kind old gentleman, and then he shows you not so kind, and he's showing you the flood in the Noah story. But you can imagine a God who created the world and who's watching over it and judging it. Uh, or you can take, which is a standard theistic position, you find that in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, even in Hinduism, uh, some kinds of Hinduism, and then, or the opposite, which is sort of the Gnostic position that this world is made by an evil God who um, we, we need to reject and that the God of the Hebrew Bible is this evil God and Jesus is the true God and we need to, to go with Jesus and, and reject uh, the God of the, of the Hebrew scripture. Watts then says that's absurd and his argument is not well thought out necessarily, just his assertion is, is that consciousness can't come from nothing that trial and error isn't enough. It's not that consciousness is a byproduct of the complexity of the, the physical world. It's rather that the world itself is intrinsically conscious and slowly evolving uh, to greater and greater degrees of consciousness. And then he, if we could have seen it, he shows us the earth from outer space several billion years ago, and there's some aliens who come by and they see a barren rock and they say, ah, oh, there's nothing here, it's just rocks. And um, then they come back a couple billion years later and they see that, no, the thing is populated with, with human beings and all this creative stuff is going on. And they say, ah, oh, we didn't understand. We didn't realize it looked like rocks, but in fact, it's the rocks were slowly, you know, peopling is how he put it. And the analogy he uses and the one that's really um, what we're dealing with 
in this webinar today is oh, open the presentation. There we go. Is this one that, that he calls appling. And he uses the analogy of an apple tree and apples. And it's pretty close where we're talking about. So when you ask the question, where do where did I come from? There's basically two answers. I either came from here, and, and I'm an organic part of, of what's happening, which is Alan Watts' view and, and mine, or I came from somewhere else. And there's all kinds of somewhere else theories. If you look at Genesis uh, 1, uh, God creates men and women at the same time, and he does so simply by fiat. He says, you know, let us create human beings in our image after our likeness. And then it says, and God created them, male and female, God created them. So it just happens, but it doesn't happen organically. God makes the human race and plops us on the earth. We're, as it says in the slide, we're actually aliens to the planet. And then all religions that take that as a starting point are trying to get off planet. And the idea is to then say, okay, I'm not really from here. I don't want to stay here. I want to go either back to where I came from, some golden age, or you know, forward to where I'm supposed to be, a, another kind of utopia golden age, but off planet, not part of nature. And that's why when we get to the question, where am I going, there's the whole theory that you're going to heaven or something like that. So that's the alien theory, that you're plopped here from outside. The organic theory is chapter two of Genesis, where we get a totally different view of how the humans were created. And there, God, in a much more anthropomorphic form, actually makes a, a mud person and then breathes life into it. And the mud person is literally earth and it's dirt. And the, in, the, in the Jewish tradition, the, the rabbis ask what kind of dirt. And their answer is God took dirt from all over the planet Earth so that the first human being was every possible shade of dirt that there is. So we were sort of plaid or, or madras or something. And, and no, no one color was um, preferred over, over any of the other. But moving, you know, that, that's not, not the major issue. The major issue is we actually came out of the earth. And that's the pun in the Bible between the word Adam, which means human, not man, as most of our Bibles say, but Adam, human, from Adama, earth. We're organic, we belong, just like an apple from an apple tree. So those, those are really the two ways of looking at, at our origins. Either we belong here or we don't. Here's a text from the Bhagavad Gita, and, and all of these are gonna, form, uh, are gonna focus on that second view. <coughs> so the whole world is pervaded by me, so me being God, and so, Literally, in the Bhagavad Gita, we're talking about Krishna. It's a Hindu text. We're talking about Krishna. And, uh, but in the context of the perennial philosophy, the me is the divine that is us. Right? Because we're, you want to imagine God is the apple tree and we're the apples of you know, God's being. So the whole, someone's sick. I <laughs> hope you get better soon. The whole world is pervaded by me, yet my form is not seen. I'll come back to that. All living things have their being in me, yet I am not limited by them. Let, let's go through those two verses, and, and we can talk about this. The whole world is pervaded by me, yet my form is not seen. It's very important that we recognize that you and I are pervaded by the divine, filled by God, but our form isn't God's form. So when I try to explain this to kids, I use different size and shape, pots and pans and bottles and beakers. And I start off with a big picture of water. And then I pour the water uh, into, well, just for example, a tall, thin vase. And I ask the kids, okay, so what's the shape of the water? Well, it's tall and it's thin. Then we'll take the water in the vase and we pour it into uh, a pie pan. So it's round and, and flat and thin. And then I ask the kids, okay, now what's the shape of water? And they'll say it's round and flat and thin. And then I say, okay, so what's the real shape of water? Is it tall and thin or is it round, flat and thin? 
And then you can pour it into a square one, you can pour it into a bowl, you can you know, do all these different things with it. And you ask the same question over and over again, and quickly you realize that water has no shape. It takes on all possible shape. So the whole world is pervaded by me. The whole world is, is, is Krishna, is, is the divine. And yet nothing in the world is the actual form of the divine. So in Hinduism, you have the phrase, tat tvam asi, thou art that, you're everything. God is everything. Uh, and then you have the phrase, neti neti, but not this and not that. So no matter what you're looking at, you're looking at God, but you can't then say, oh, God is the shape of a tree, or God is the shape of a wolf, or God is the shape of, of you or I. So it's, yes, we're all part of the manifestation, uh, we're each manifestations of God, but no one is actually the, the shape of God. Or the, no, God, God is us, but we are, um, we are not God, if you like. And all living beings have their, all living things have their being in me, yet I'm not limited by them. This is the panentheist position. So that, very quickly, there's five ways to think about God. There's the theist, and that's the, the, the idea that, and there's variations of these, but the basic theistic idea is that there is a God out there somewhere, outside the natural world, who creates the natural world, who watches over it, who judges it, who punishes it, who rewards it, all the stuff that we get in classical religious theologies. And um, that's, you know, we, we worship that God. The closest thing we have to a theist is an atheist. An atheist and a theist agree on the definition of God. They would both say, if you ask an atheist, what's God? An atheist probably says, although the new atheist would, would say that this way, God is a self-conscious being outside of creation who formed the world, who watches the world, judges the world, all of that. But I don't believe that God exists. That's what makes them an a non-theist. They agree with a the theist as to what God is. They disagree as to whether God is. Uh, if, if that's a little confusing, think in terms of unicorns. So you and I would probably agree that a unicorn is a big white horse with a spiral horn in its head. And you might think that unicorns exist. I am an a unicornist. I don't believe that unicorns exist, but I agree with you that a unicorn is a big white horse with a spiral horn in its head. So the definitions we can agree on, whether they refer to anything, in reality, we would disagree on. The third is the agnostic. The agnostic also agrees with the atheist and the theist as to the definition of God. God's a self-conscious being outside the universe who created, watches over it, rewards and punishes, all of that. And the agnostic says you cannot prove or disprove this theory, therefore I don't know. I'm agnostic. A again is a negative, gnostic is knowledge. I have no knowledge whether or not this God exists. It's it's popular among the more educated or thoughtful atheists to call themselves agnostic because they'll say, look, it's impossible to define, to prove God exists and it's impossible to prove God doesn't exist. So I really can't say I'm an atheist. I'll say I'm an agnostic. I, I think that's tolerable uh, because we're not talking about God in the abstract. We're talking about a specific definition of God. In this case, the theistic definition, God is a being outside the universe of created and watches over it and all of that. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in that God. If my choice is that God or no God, I vote for no God. And, and I'm, not, I'm not, yeah, I can't prove it, but it's not really an option for me. So as a Jew, I do not believe in a God who chooses the Jewish people, in a God who dictates books on a mountaintop, uh, a God who um, dabbles in real estate and, and chose Israel of all the places in the world to stick the Jewish people. I, I don't believe in any of that. I think that's all sociologically true. I mean, Jews think that, uh, but I, I give it no ontological weight. I don't really think any of it is, is true. I don't think God has a son. I don't think God uh, dictated the Quran to Muhammad. I don't think God rode in a chariot with Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. I think these are stories that people make up to, to explore what the universe is. And, and obviously we use these texts all the time. I do, I do, and we are in this webinar, but I don't take any of them literally. Uh, the third, the fourth option is this, all living things have their being in me, yet I am not limited by them. 
well, actually, the fourth option is would say all living beings, uh, all living things have their being in me, and I am limited by them. That's pantheism. God is what is. And so if, if nature is what we're talking about, then God is nature, and that's the end of it. But a panentheist, which is where I park my, you know, put my hat, uh, is this all living things have their being in me, yet I am not limited by them. I think there is a reality that includes the, the universe that you and I know and, and includes the universe that you and I can't know, but it's also greater, an infinite field of possibility. I think God is process. God is, is um, dynamic. What I like more than, than the, the Lord, you know, Adonai or Yahweh, who creates, um, who has a body in a sense and does all these things in the, in the Bible. I like the, the definition of God that's given to us in, Gen, in uh, Exodus, where God says, I am that which I am becoming. Ehiya asher ehiya. God is a process. God is in the process of becoming. God is not the all-knowing because you can't know what's next. It's, it's a surprise. God is as surprised as the rest of us. But we're all part of the same evolving system. So in our little speck of the universe, you and I are, I was going to say maybe the antennae of God. You know, we're the way God realizes what's happening in this part of the universe. So we're all part of that, that divine, the unfolding divine consciousness. But none of us, well, all of us are, com- are completely God. None of us alone is, is the totality of God. Um, then he says, nevertheless, they do not consciously abide in me which means we don't know what, what the truth is. We're not aware. Such is my divine sovereignty that though I, the supreme self, am the cause and upholder of all, yet I remain outside. God is within and without. As the mighty wind, though moving everywhere, has no resting place but space, so have I all these beings, no, uh, so have all these beings no home but me. So, so you follow that? I mean, this is, this, this is pretty much what we talked about last time but we're taking it in a, in a direction now. Before it wasn't going anywhere. Now we're talking about evolution. Comments, questions? Yeah, um, Andy has a question in the chat box. Uh, his question is, I can't unmute. <laughs> oh, no, before yeah. that. Uh, does God as process have a purpose? Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> Do I have to answer? Yeah. Uh, I, it's very controversial, but I would say, I don't know if I like the word purpose, but yes, um, God has a direction. God is moving toward greater and greater levels of consciousness. Is God doing that consciously? Eh, then I'm not convinced. But is there, if you look at, at you know, the, the last 13.8 billion years in our universe, from the Big Bang to, you know, five seconds ago, there seems to me to be a progression, a direction to larger and larger levels of complexity, but also greater and greater levels of consciousness. And, and on an ethical level, though, you know, what happened in Boston today, you might think this is Pollyanna-ish. But even on an ethical level, I think that we're moving from a non, from a zero-sum worldview, tribe against tribe, people against people, religion against religion, more and more and more of of humanity is just giving up on that entire thing. In fact, just yesterday I read this article about what's happening in the church, uh, in the Protestant, actually it's this Christian church in general in the United States, and they were saying that people are no longer, they no longer care about theology. They don't believe the theology that they're being taught. They go to church and the God that they're engaged with is now their a therapist. And they they talk to God as they would talk to a therapist. And you know, I don't know if this is good or bad, but you could understand it as in, in the positive that people are I'm I'm just can no longer get get my head around a punishing God, an evil, you know, not they wouldn't say evil, but a punishing God, a God who sends you to hell because you don't believe a certain way. People are just they're not arguing. I mean, me, I argue against it. But people who go to church more and more have simply abandoned thinking about that. So like half the Catholics who use birth control, they, they know the church is against it. They think it's irrelevant, so they skip it. Uh, you know, American Catholics. Um, so people are just dumping the theology from their consciousness. 
and they're using God as they would a therapist. Now, I don't know if that as a practice is a good idea because you're really just doing therapy on yourself. And so God's ultimately going to either, it's going to be a projection of either your shadow side, which is pretty dangerous, or God's going to, you guys are either going to excuse everything you do or God's going to be upset with everything you do. And, and that's, you know, a therapist is, is a little different than that. But, but it's interesting that the theology is, is going away. Um, partners denotes a separateness of some sort. Uh, Andy says partners. Where, where does he say partners? I don't see that. There's a question that Andy asked. Yeah, partners with God in the purpose of creation. Oh, I missed that one. Uh, no, for the same reason that Shauna said, partners denotes a separateness. Um, we can't be part of God because we are God, right? We're just God in extension. So it's we are the way God is aware of whatever you're aware of at the moment. So, so, so let me, let me question. You, you, you're saying, if I'm understanding you, that God has a personal aspect, but that we are it. Yeah. Now, we're not the only it. We are, we are part yes. of our, our, our we, we are God's personal aspect, the humans, the universe becoming conscious of itself. God you right. know, developing a personal aspect. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and so, Bill, that's, and, and you're, you know, you, know you, you and I have talked about this before at the retreat, that you mean, God is, you are God billing, and I and I am God Ramiing, and there's God Shaunaing, and uh, you know, and that that's how it is. Yeah. So so no one of us has the whole perspective from that ego point of view, but you know, God is is all of these things. But then other planets, other universes, other beings. I mean, you know, I I, I don't I don't separate people from anything else. So so my dog is laying over here. Is is also part of God's experience. Is also a manifestation of of God. Um, so just in case you think it's a uniquely Hindu thing, here's from Al Ghazali, uh, a Muslim scholar, and it says there's nothing in existence other than God, except that it is created by God's action, flowing from God's justice in the best, the most perfect, complete, and just way. And he puts a spin on it that you may or may not like. Uh, I, I find it a little bit too, I don't know, Pollyanna-ish to use the word again. But just to start, there is nothing in existence other than God. Right? That's that's the Sufi Muslim mystic read of the Shahada, which is the Muslim affirmation of faith of the first half. La ilaha illallah. There is, there is no God but God. But people like Al-Ghazali read it. Uh, there is nothing but God. Now then he goes ahead and defines God as being, as Muslims do, all good, all just, all compassionate, so that whatever flows is God's justice, is perfect, is complete, you know, and all of that. I, I don't I don't buy that. That's that's not my personal position. I think that everything flows from God and that's the good and the bad. I, I prefer uh, chapter two, verse ten. Or the other, maybe it's, yeah, verse ten of the book of Job, where Job says, "Shouldn't we accept the good and the bad from God?" Which implies, as does Isaiah chapter forty-five, verse seven, where God says, "Look, I create light and dark, good and evil. I do that because that's I'm the only thing there is. So if there's good, it's me. If there's bad, it's me. If it's light, it's me. If it's dark, it's me. If it's you know people enjoying themselves, we saw." On the video in Boston today, these these two young girls and their mom, and they were having fun, and then poof, there's this explosion. So they went from from joy to horror in a split second, and and God's all of that. So I I don't see God as having a um, you know a moral tone to it. So so Shauna says, uh, as is the perpetrators in Boston today. Yeah, the people who set off the bombs are the person. It's difficult to comprehend. It's absolutely difficult to comprehend, <laughs> not just for you, Shauna. It's difficult because you're saying, no, God has a dark side. You want to believe that God is good. And, and you're free to believe that, of course. Um, but what happens when you do is you have to explain evil some way. And 
there aren't that many options. So in Christianity, one of the ways we explain evil is to invent the devil and say, okay, there's a war going on. This is classic Protestant, contemporary Protestant theology. There's a war going on between Jesus and the devil, and you've got to choose sides. And if you don't choose the right Protestant version of Protestantism, you're on the wrong side. And Jesus will win, but you'll lose if, you have, if you're not in the right, the right, um, the right army. Uh, but but that's how you say, oh, no, God is all good. All evil comes from the devil. Or you can say, you know, like uh, Rhonda Byrne does. Um, Lindsay's po what do you call that? She's also Australian. Do you know, do you know, Ron, all Australians know each other. Lindsay, do you know Rhonda Byrne? Lindsay says, nope. Okay. Well, <laughs> Rhonda Byrne wrote the book, The Secret. And in The Secret, she puts out this idea that whatever happens to you, happens to you because you thought it. So um, if you say, I don't want to have, if you say, uh, I want to be rich, then you'll be rich. If you say, I don't want to be poor, the universe doesn't understand negatives, only understands nouns, and you'll become poor. If you have cancer, it's because you thought cancer. If you, um, yeah, she says, now I know, you saw that movie, right? So. So everything is a product of your own mind. Uh, and so, so it's, it's a moral system based on blaming the victim. Um, because now that you know that your own mind is creating your own reality, then if bad things happen to you, it's because you deserve them, because you, you set that in motion. I don't believe any of that. I think that God is infinite, that God unfolds infinite possibility, that given the nature of probability theory, some things are going to happen, and, you know, some of them are going, to, are going to be horrible from the human point of view, and some of them will be wonderful from the human point of view. Some people are going to be saintly, and some people are going to be evil and wicked. And all of it is a manifestation of God, because God manifests, you know, the entirety of, of options. Um, so just to take one more, we won't go through all eight of these, we'll go to the other piece, but you, this is Marcus Aurelius, so go to the Greeks. You must now at last perceive of what universe you are a part and of what administrative universe your existence flows from and that a limit of time is fixed for you, which if you do not use it for clearing away the clouds from your mind, time will go and you will go and it will never return. So in other words, you're here for a fixed amount of time. You better use it to realize who you really are. And when you realize who you really are, then we can shift over and, and talk about where you might go. So. Um, I'm going to actually switch. I'm cognizant of the time. Just hang on a second. Change presentation. Where am I going? Yeah. So while that's loading, let me just make sure we're, we're clear on what we're talking about. So the, the perennial philosophy is this appling notion that the universe is intrinsically conscious. It's intrinsically intelligent. It doesn't need an intelligent designer outside of it. It is intelligent. It operates through trial and error. It does experiments. And the experiments that, well, who knows? You know, some experiments to see cockroaches were incredibly, are incredibly successful. They've been here for, you know, for millions of years. They'll probably still be here millions of years from now. They're very, very good. But their level of consciousness is quite limited, and they're not evolving, I guess. Um, at least not when they're in my house, they don't evolve. <laughs> I crush them. Um, but uh, other aspects of, of creation are evolving. I think we're part of that. Now, how we evolve, you know, is it simply biological? I just picked up, well, I put it away, I would show it to you. But Ray Kurzweil's new book, How to Build the Brain. Ray Kurzweil is the guy who wrote Singularity, and that he says, I think, if I get my dates right, uh, Sometime in the year 2020, we're going to achieve the first stages of singularity where carbon-based life forms, you and I, <coughs> excuse me, are going to merge with silicon-based life forms like computers. And you'll be able to upload your, eventually, <coughs> excuse me, you'll be able to upload your consciousness into a um, undying hard drive. You know, I, I have yet to see one that doesn't crash, but that's the idea. And you can have some kind of immortality that way. Uh, that's that's a theory. That's called the trans, the transhuman position. I don't know. What? 
if I believe that, I don't know if I like that, it, it's, but it, it's just a theory that's out there. Uh, but there's also the notion that, um, you know, we are just evolving spiritually, and that's what a lot of the mystics will say, and Wilbur will say, will say that through spiritual practice, meditation, different things, you can actually expand your consciousness. And for me, what expanding consciousness means is you're widening the circle of compassion, that you can ultimately be your enemy as yourself. You can still have enemies in the sense that there are people who, who oppose you for whatever reason, but you can, you can embrace them lovingly. You can treat them with respect and compassion, even though they seem to be resisting what it is you want to do. Um, so there's lots of ways of thinking about where this is going. But what we're talking about with this third question, where am I going? We're talking really about death. And to, to answer the question, just got to remember where we came from. So who we are is we are God manifest. We, where we came from, we came from the apple tree, the way an apple comes from. We came from God, the way an apple comes from an apple tree. We are simply God's, God blossoming in, uh, in, in humans, or what Alan Watts called, if you ever get to see that video, peopling. So the universe peoples, or at least on planet Earth, the universe peoples. Uh, but then what? What happens when, when you and I die? And obviously, this is a huge question for people. You might argue, I often argue, that, that since Neanderthal people, um, all of our spirituality has been tied up with this question of where do we go when we die? And religion is all about what happens to us when we die. Uh, that's perhaps of the, the five questions. That may be the only question that ultimately matters to people. And it can be used to manipulate people so easily. So, you know, for example, if, if, if you believe in um, heaven and hell, uh, that you're somehow when the body dies, the personality lives on, then you want to make sure you go to heaven. And it has to be the personality. I mean, what, what you know, if, if my soul, if there's a soul that is separate from my body and the soul is going to live on after my body, and we're talking about heaven or hell, that soul must be my personality. So, you know, it depends where you live, but where I live, most people that I run into believe they have a soul. The soul will survive their body when they die, and they will go to heaven uh, because they all belong to the Christian sect that tells them they're in the right sect to go to heaven. They're not sure about their neighbors, but they know they're going. And uh, they, they then say, uh, and I'm going to meet my loved ones there. So that only makes sense if we're talking about personality. So, you know, if, if my parents die, which they will eventually, uh, and my parents go to heaven, when I go to heaven, my expectation would be that I'm see, you know, I'll meet my parents. Uh, what they'll look like, they'll have to be recognizable to me. It can't be total strangers coming up to me and saying, oh, yeah, we're your parents. I mean, that's not who I want. I want my mom and my dad the way I remember them. Do I want them in their 80s or do I want them in their 60s? You know, I don't know. But that we can argue. So I, I think I mentioned, if I didn't, I'll just say very quickly, in the Islamic tradition, as it was, as it was explained to me last semester by our local imam, when you die and go to heaven, assuming you get to heaven, you are 33 years old in heaven. Everyone's 33 years old. I don't know if I'd recognize my folks at 33. Um, I was alive when they were 33, but I don't know if I'd recognize them. But um, it has to be your parents. Otherwise, what's the point? If it's just some ball of light that somehow says, oh, I am your parent. I mean, that's not what I want. I want my mother. I want her to you know, give me a hug. So, so it has to be something in us that is identifiable that transcends the death of the body. If you believe in reincarnation, it's something similar. I mean, there's no point in this ball of light um, hopping from body to body to body. Though it won't look like me, reincarnation is not about the reincarnation of a specific form. It's about the carrying on of some kind of identifiable stream of consciousness. Um, that, uh, whatever that thing is, it has to be identifiable to me as me. Um, and, and of course, when you recognize 
when you have past life regressions and you have past life memories, you're remembering, oh, yes, I was Cleopatra or I was Cleopatra's best friend. I mean, no one was ever Cleopatra's chambermaid. Uh, you know, most people are too egotistical for that. They're always somebody either famous or close to the famous. Uh, but all of this depends, whether we're talking about heaven or hell uh, or reincarnation, it all depends on the ongoingness of ego, in quotes, you know, some, some type of personality. I don't, I don't buy that at all. I don't find that comforting. I don't find that meaningful. Uh, and, and so when we look at it from this uh, perennial wisdom position, we're getting the flip side of the last question. Where did I come from? I came from somewhere else or I came from here. Where am I going? I'm either going somewhere else or I'm not going anywhere. And I don't think we're going anywhere because where does the wave go when it returns to the ocean? Nowhere, because it's the ocean. It's not that the wave is gone nearly. I mean, that's the form. The form is gone. But when you realize you're actually the, the ocean in extension, when that extension is gone, the ocean is still the ocean. So Kathy, Wendy, and I made a little video. I don't know where it is. <laughs> what state it's in, but uh, we, we did a video of me trying to explain this um, the way I explained it in my book on called Rabbi Rami's Guide to Parenting. And I, I would give kids a piece of rope, and I don't have one here, but you give kids a piece of rope, and obviously kids who can tie a knot, because this is all about knot tying. And you ask the kids to tie a knot in the rope, and everyone ties a knot in her rope, and then we'd have a discussion, what's the relationship between knots and a rope? So, the knot is simply the rope in a specific shape. Then we tie a second knot in the rope, and we compare the two knots. So each person has her own rope. But we compare the two knots, and they're not, one's a little younger, and one's a little older, and one's in one part of the rope, and one's in another part of the rope. One's probably a little thicker, a little thinner, a little tighter, a little looser. All right, so they're different. One of those knots we'll call Rami, you know, in this case, and another knot we'll call uh, Grandma, all right, my grandma. So Grandma Fanny, that'll be, that'll be the second knot. So Grandma Fanny dies, so I untie the Grandma Fanny knot. Where did she go? I mean, she's not there anymore. Did she go somewhere? No, there's nowhere to go. She's the rope. The rope is still there. So the shape is gone, but the reality of the rope stays. That's how I answer the question, where am I going for myself? That... Um, I simply lose this form, but the greater reality of which I am a part stays the same. The, well, let me, let me hold off. There's one more piece to that, but let me just, let me just wait on that. So you know, here we had a moment ago, Krishna is saying everything comes from Krishna. I am the all-pervading you know, reality. And now Krishna says, I am all-devouring death. I am the origin of all that shall happen, and I'm also the end of everything that does happen. It's all, it's all God. And then this is the passage from Isaiah that I mentioned earlier. I make good, I make evil. Everything is, is coming from this singular reality. So how should you die? And this is, this is what Krishna's advice. If at the time of death you think only of me, and thinking thus leaves the body and go forth, assuredly you will know me. Now, here it sounds like reincarnation, and I'm not saying it doesn't mean that. I mean, that's, that's probably part of the, the that, that is part of the Krishna idea. But I'm not taking it literally. You leave the body, you die, the body dies. You will know the divine as yourself. The ocean, the wave knows itself to be the ocean. On whatever sphere of being your mind may be intent at the time of death, there you will go. Now, this is a pretty standard reincarnation idea very finely developed in Tibetan Buddhism. If you've ever read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, and there's a History Channel video, I think about it, if you want to watch on YouTube, it was a, must have been an hour show. And when the person dies, the priest, the Lama, comes and reads the Tibetan Book of the Dead. And it's basically a manual, it's, it's a tour guide for what's happening to you. And you go through these different bardo states. So you're you're passing, your consciousness is passing through uh, different states. The first one is you see this light, just like in a near-death experience, 
And the priest will say, reading from the Book of the Dead, go to the light. You're the light. Become the light. That's who you really are. Just go into it. If you do, it's over. The wave returns to the ocean, and at the moment of return, realizes it's the ocean, experiences what's called in Hinduism, Sanskrit, sat chit ananda, pure consciousness, uh, pure being, pure bliss, and the ego is annihilated. In the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, it's, you know, it's read for weeks. So I said, oh, okay, the next chapter, all right, you missed the light. Don't, don't panic. There's something else. You'll see something else. Go with that. And then it, as it goes along and you keep missing all these opportunities to, to become enlightened, it'll say, okay, look, there's some scary stuff coming up. Don't be scared. If you get scared, you're going to come back in some horrible way. So it tries to talk you through all this and eventually gives you, tries to talk you into a, uh, uh, an incarnation that from which you can again try to try to become enlightened but there's all kinds of detours along the way if you're not ready for it i don't that's not my approach but it's just you know it's just another approach i think we're all waves we die we all realize at the last instant that we're the ocean and that that is the end of it it's an ecstatic um, release into our true self uh, and then Krishna says, but if you're always meditating on me, if that's how you spend your last moments, if you can do that, then you just become what you really are, which is Krishna, which is God. Um, this, this is you also, one of the lost sayings of Jesus from the Gospel of the Hebrews. You also find something very similar in the Gospel of Thomas, where Jesus says, do not stop searching until you find, and when you find, you'll be astonished. And when you're astonished, you will reign. And once you reign, you will find rest. In the Gospel of Thomas, it's, it's usually astonished. It's usually translated as upset or troubled, disturbed in some way. And the idea is that you have to search until you realize that you're not who you think you are, that the ego is not it. And that's what's troubling. Here, it's astonishing, which is much nicer, but it's troubling. And when you can go through the trouble or go through the astonishment and realize that you are this divine being, you will reign, and what does reign mean? Reign means you will no longer be at the whim of your baser desires. You will no longer be at the whim of the egotistical part of yourself. You will realize that you're also the ocean, and then you will reign over the waves, foibles, and then you'll find rest, because now you can, you don't have to try to be something you're not. You're now truly uh, what you really are. And I'm going to open this up for conversation in a second. Let's just see if there's anything. Um, again, lost saying of Jesus, what's the place we're going to? The apostles ask him, and he says, stand in the place you can reach. You know, which for me means you know, be present where you are, and you can reach this, this um, larger dimension of, of who you are. The, the ocean and the wave are never separated. Um, and here's a very similar thing from Muhammad. I'm not going to go read these. You, you can see the guys. I want you to know they're there. Uh, there's an interesting one. I'm just going to say this. This shows how Jewish these are. When you look at these other ones, they're all mystical. Here's the Jewish approach, the next two. When you die and meet God, four questions will be asked of you. Did you make time for learning wisdom? Did you devote sufficient energy to your family? Did you conduct your business with integrity? Did you always maintain hope? I mean, that's what. No, it's, it's sort of classic Jewish way of looking at the universe. Not did you believe in me? Did you think about me? Did you meditate? It's it's this practical stuff, family business. Uh, and then in, in the Talmud itself, it says when they give this example, if you answer yes, then you go to hell because you're obviously lying. Nobody makes enough time for all these things. So you have to be honest. Say, no, I, I could have done better. And then God says, yeah, everybody could have done better. Come on in. But I like the next one. That some rabbi disagrees. And he said, this is the question they're going to ask you. Did you enjoy all legitimate pleasures that came your way? That's the way you ought to live, right? All the good stuff that was placed in your path, did you take advantage of it? Or did you say, oh, I shouldn't do this because I'm an ascetic? Or I'm a Buddhist and I can't enjoy this. Or I'm a Muslim and I can't enjoy that. Or I'm, you know, whatever it is. All legitimate pleasures. So, this is a Jewish text, so pork products are not considered a legitimate pleasure, or shrimp and all that, if you're thinking, oh, great, I'll go have a ham sandwich. But, um, you know, it's just a different way of viewing it. That um, The way I, I merge them together is that if you really understand who you are, then life is something to savor, even the horrible parts. 
even the, the, the difficult parts. So let me wrap this up and then open this up. And I know we're going to go over a little bit, and I hope you can stay with me for, for a little while. Um, the first three questions, who am I, where do they come from, where am I going, they all rely on the same realization that you and I are God in extension. We are natural to this universe. We are the way the universe or the divine or God or reality with a capital R understands itself in our place. Uh, where, where we're going is, is back to that source. And the extent to which we realize that, that we come from God and we're returning to God, is the extent to which we can, I would suggest then, enjoy all the legitimate pleasures that come our way because we're not here to earn anything. We're not here to uh, convince God to let us in. We, all, we don't have to achieve uh, something that we lack. I love Psalm 23, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. Uh, when you understand, now I don't like the shepherd metaphor, I don't like the whole notion of at the high hope it is, Jews say, you are the shepherd and we are the sheep and you are, eh. I mean, I find that really offensive. But, I'm oh, sorry, um, little, little sheep joke there, all right, fine. Um, I think it's slow in the uptake, weren't you? Okay. Anyway, I, I think that when you really understand who you are, that you are the divine, then there's nothing you lack. It doesn't mean that your life is perfect. It just means that you, you're not missing anything. It's not that you have to uh, find the, the part of you that, that's going to make everything right. Everything is right. Everything is exactly the way it has to be, given the conditions on the ground for anything to happen. What happens, happens has to happen. So you have everything you need to, to engage life fully at the moment, even when it's a horrible, a horrible experience. It's all part of this singular reality. To the extent which, to which we identify with the oceanic, with, with the cosmic, is the extent to which we avoid all kinds of uh, unnecessary suffering, beating ourselves up, I'm missing something, I'm lacking something, and the extent to which we can have compassion for ourselves and others, uh, the extent to which we, we focus on the wave or this, this ego, this form, we're needlessly miserable because it's always dying. It, it's always, it's, you know, I, I talk to my parents every couple of days and I can hear it in their voices month by month, they're getting weaker and weaker. And if I just focus on that, it gets depressing. If I realize that, you know, it's, it's the divine having this experience, it doesn't make my grief any less, but it doesn't make it any more than it has to. So, I mean, I can talk more about that when they actually pass away, hopefully before they spend my inheritance. Um, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> boy, these jokes, I guess, <laughs> flat. But okay, I'll, I'll no, we're laughing. We are. <laughs> you're laughing. You're laughing. I, th I think it's God having a very bad comic day. Anyway, let, <laughs> let me just stop and, and see what uh, your comments, questions, this conversation. Thanks, Lindsay. Laugh out loud. She says thanks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to add anything? <laughs> So this is Shauna, and I guess I know that I know that everybody thinks about these kinds of questions, but I guess in my mind, I don't know that it matters. What, what does it matter where we come from? I mean, we're here. Isn't it more about what we're doing with our lives today than it is about this mental exercise trying to figure all this out? I don't know, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be flippant, but... No, 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 I, I think it's a good question. I, I, you know, the, the way, um, and, and Lindsay's agreeing with you, you know, the, the existential position, the, the word existentialism itself, starts with the notion of existence. You exist, so now what? It doesn't matter where you came from, before you existed. It doesn't matter where you're going after you existed. Somebody should mute, because I'm hearing myself. I think it's Shauna's. I'll mute, sorry. I right, see if that helps, yeah. So, yeah, much better, thanks. So, you know, the existential position is, look, you exist. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter where you're going. It's what you do now. It's how you live now, which is what we're going to pick up next week, is how do you live. I actually think it matters, because when we imagine 
you know, and if you don't imagine anything, then it's fine. It doesn't make a difference. But when we imagine that uh, we're alien to here, we don't have the same respect for the planet that we might otherwise. Uh, I mean, I, I've heard countless people say, we don't have to worry about global warming and the rising of the seas because God promised not to drown the world again after Noah's flood. Um, it doesn't matter what happens to the earth because ultimately I'm going to heaven. It, it doesn't really matter. Uh, now, you know, you may live in a part of the world where this kind of thinking isn't, isn't prevalent. So this may be just my experience, and I, I, I would come to that. But the people I know who are all about where did I come from and where am I going are people who are very frightened. And they express that fear often, not always, but they often express that fear by being very angry with people who don't share their position. So it, it, it seems to matter. Now, you know, again, I have no idea who caused the bombings uh, in Boston today. I don't know what their ideology was, but you, you can imagine a couple possibilities. It's tax day. So maybe these are anti-government people. So, you know, they, they have their, their philosophy, you know, where, where they think they came from, what they're supposed to be doing is, is influenced by whatever their philosophy is. And, you know, they'll act this way. Uh, a jihadist who thinks that one of the best ways to get into heaven is to die in a, in a, a suicide attack. You know, and suddenly they do a suicide attack. In Israel, uh, when you talk to some of these religious settlers who are doing all kinds of horrible things because they think God wants them to, to take the land and do that, they have a right to the land, uh, it, it absolutely impacts their daily lives and the daily lives of the people that they occupy. So um, I, I don't think it's irrelevant to the world we live in. It may be irrelevant to, to any one of us, and, you know, in, in particular. But I think it has it has terrible relevance to the quality of the life of the of the planet. Uh, so that, so that's why you know I talk about it. now you know that either um, Lindsay says so it does matter, but should it matter? I don't know. That's a should. I have no I have no idea. I mean I I don't know. Um, if if you think that that your um, eternal reward depends on which camp of religion you belong to, then yeah, it should matter. I mean, because your, your fate depends on it. If you don't have that belief, um, if you don't believe in heaven or hell, or you believe that everybody goes to heaven or everybody goes to hell or whatever it is, then yeah, it, it probably shouldn't matter. But if you believe in a zero-sum world, uh, which is the vast majority of people on this planet believe in a zero-sum world, which means there are winners and losers, then you want to be a winner and then that whole belief structure, how you win, uh, becomes uh, dominant. And if you ask them, should it matter, they'll say, my God, it should matter. It should be the most important thing in your life because your eternal um, reward or lack thereof depends on it. So, you know, to say it shouldn't matter assumes uh, freedom from certain kinds of theologies. But you know, to the people to whom it does matter, uh, it, it matters absolutely. Um, I, I says, have, uh, yeah. Am I in? Who's, who's? Hello? I hear someone, but yeah, who, who are we talking to? Oh, this is Betty. Betty, this hi. Is Betty, Betty. I, I, and I, I've been um, thinking a lot <laughs> as you've been talking, and I'm probably closer to your parents' experience than you are. Because I'm in my 80s and I have a long, long, long life already, and I've come to some decisions that are my decisions, and they may not be somebody else's, but they make sense to me about who I am and where I come from and where I'm going. Because I believe in life. I mean, if you want to call life God, that's okay too, and um, I would agree with that. And um, it, that's my idea that, that that is what God is, is aliveness. And that's what we're, where we're all going. That's where we came from, and that's where we're going. That's where I'm going anyway. And I call myself Earth Chocolate Chip Cookie because that's what I want to be. I want to go into <laughs> the Earth. <laughs> 
with the attitude that which uh, of which I dug out of the earth for my own experience, and um, and that feels like a good ending to me that I will go on in nature as feeding other life forms. And that's where I'm going. Uh, but yeah, a know. very organic. Right. Yeah, it's right. very organic. But, uh, but there is this mystery. And I live with the mystery, and I cherish the mystery, because I do believe that there is a part of me that's not my body, and call it soul, but it's the part of me that I think belongs to uh, forever, and I think it evolves, and I think God evolves. I don't think the same God is here now as the one who was there when... Noah was here. I think evolution, I learned this from a, a bar mitzvah kid in my synagogue. He said evolution is built into the Torah. And I believe it because I experience it. And I know God is evolving because we are evolving. We don't cut off hands anymore. There's lots of, lots of. Uh, well, you and I don't, but some places they still do. Yeah. Cut hands off. Yeah, so so I think that's really that's really interesting. So so I don't know if you're up on this or not, but uh, there's a whole theology called process theology, uh, which says that God is evolving, and the way God evolves here, this little part of the universe, is through conscious beings. And you and I may be, you know, humans may be the most conscious on this planet. I'm not sure about, you know, maybe dolphins or whales are, are more conscious than we are, but um, that God is evolving through us, with us, as us. And uh, whatever we learn is the way God learns. A, it's, it's a little bit, sounds things. a little bit anthropomorphic. But, um, but that's, that's, what, that's what the process theologians say. I, I forget what magazine this was, but um, I mean, process theology is very big in, in certain branches of Christianity, and it's just making inroads into Judaism. There was a whole Jewish journal devoted an entire issue to process theology. Um, okay. As far as you know, God evolving in the Bible, uh, there's an interesting guy that Richard Friedman wrote a book called The Disappearance of God. And he says, if you take the Jewish Bible, just the way the books are laid out from Genesis to the end, he says, God slowly disappears. And in Genesis, God is doing everything. Yes. In Exodus, God does a lot, but not everything. And then you, you make your way to, to the prophets where God doesn't do anything. He just talks to the prophets, basically. And then they, they teach principles, holiness principles, godliness principles. And then you get into the writings like Ruth um, and uh, Esther and Ecclesiastes and Psalms and Proverbs, where God is really absent. I mean, Psalms, you pray to God, but God doesn't do anything. Uh, so, so Friedman, Richard Friedman's argument is, is that the Jews evolved in their theology and they, they internalized the understanding of God so that God starts out as someone outside the universe and slowly becomes the principles by which we are to live our lives and then slowly becomes embodied within us so that we no longer make reference to an external deity but now live out the godliness ourselves. And he says that's, you know, that, that's the evolution he sees. But, but another, in process theology, you know, God is, is growing. But there's another thing that, that is touching me right now that's very, very deep, and that is the belief I have that if we don't get the lessons from our history of development, we got to experience them again. And I have... I have an idea that we are living another golden calf experience because we didn't get it. And just as you said that God, God has plays a disappearing act, I think that's going on right now. Sense that I have that that we better wake up to our our uh, our own godliness if that's where we've put God since we are the image of him. If that's where we think God is inside of us, then we better start being visible. 
because uh, the golden calf is really threatening right now. So who do you think we're worshiping? What do you think we're worshiping? Money. What's the golden? Money, money. Money. The same gold. They took all the gold and made a, 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 a calf out of it. And we're just looking right at the money. Like in yeah. everybody's life, it's like overwhelming us. Like God disappeared from most. Yeah, I mean, that's, I, I certainly can't, certainly, certainly, certainly I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with that. Um, you know, and, and the entire, the entire system in which we operate is driven by that idea. And that's, and that's, that is, that is the, the capitalist wake up call. system. If that isn't the wake up call, what is? <laughs> so then, then Andy <laughs> says, we are way before the golden calf. We're in midst Ryan. So enslaved, I'm assuming, to something. Uh, so we, we, can, we can all take a few moments and find our most dystopian metaphor for what's going on. On the other hand, yeah. um, you know, there's the, the 49th rung of degradation. So on, on the other hand, there's other things going on. Um, yeah. but you see, you do see some really interesting, positive things happening. Um, and, and so, so yeah, it's, you know, some of us, the fact that we know that we're worshiping the golden calf or we know we're in, enslaved in Egypt uh, to one thing or another, uh, the, the only way you can even know that's a negative is, is that somehow something's evolving that, that says that's negative. So, you know, I mean, I, I look at the world as a mixed bag. I mean, it depends on, yeah. on the day, am I optimistic or pessimistic, but but it is a mixed bag, and, and there are things happening, I think, that are, that are uh, profoundly hopeful. And, and part of it is this movement beyond the brand name religions. I mean, you know, when, when you talk about worshiping a golden calf, you know, part of it is you could say, oh, it's the system and we worship money. Uh, but it's, it's, I don't think it's that simple, because I think uh, it, it, when, when, who benefits when you worship the golden calf? Not the calf, the priests. Who benefits when you have a temple sacrificial system? It's the priests, not the sheep, uh, that you're sacrificing. And who benefits when when you have a system where you've got to? I mean, what's what's the sole purpose of a Catholic priest? Now, the only thing they really do that nobody else can do is turn uh, wine into blood and bread into body. That magic. So so when when you make the Eucharist, the Catholic Eucharist, the center of your religious life. You're really making the priest the center of your life. So I think that, that yeah, we're worshiping the golden calf, but behind that calf, you know, is, is the, the, the wizard of Oz, you know, the little man with a large microphone, megaphone, and, and they're setting up the system and we're being manipulated and we're being sold this, this bill of goods that if you don't do it my way, you don't get the prize and the prize is eternal life or the prize is enlightenment or, you know, whatever the prize is. When, when um, I was Shauna, but I, I lost the thing here. You know, what difference does it make? You know, we're here. If you could actually live that way, it breaks the back of religion. Because religion is not really about being here. It's about being the next place, either in the next world or the more perfect version of this world. Um, if you really can say, it doesn't matter where I came from, doesn't matter where I'm going, it only matters how I live at this moment. Religion has nothing to say to you. I mean, Buddhism does, but, but you know, we don't talk about Western religion. It doesn't have much to say to us. Um, isn't the message because wake it's all up? About... Sorry? Isn't the message wake up and, and who's, find who's yourself? Message? I didn't hear you. I'm sorry. I, I mean, I, I, I would say, yeah, but whose message are we talking about? The, the message of the times, the message of... Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Wake up to who you really are. Yes, I would, I would say that exactly. But I would then say that the, the civil, the, the uh, culture, religious, political, economic, doesn't want you to wake up. Because when you wake up, you stop buying stuff. Uh -huh. uh, when you wake up, you start worrying about, am I belonging to the right church? If I got the right beliefs? Am I following enough of the commandments? But you know, all, and all the, the things culture. that, you know, that's that we... The, but that's not, that's just the culture. That's not, that's not the, the experience of waking up. Exactly. 
Right. I, I agree. And, and, and what I'm saying is the culture doesn't want you to wake up. Uh -huh. The culture needs you asleep. Um, right. Because that's how people take advantage of us. Time for a new culture. Um, Let's do it. <laughs> well, that's the question. That's is it moving in that direction or not? Yeah, that's, I mean, we can, that's a nice way to end. And, and the question is, are we moving that way or not? And, and I think, I would say we are. I, I would say that there's a van, a, you know, it's small, but there's a vanguard of people who are moving in that direction. Um, and and that's, that's an optimistic thing. Okay, oh, I went way over. I apologize. Thank you all for hanging in there with me. Uh, okay, so, so next week we're going to focus on uh, how should we live? And next week is our third week. So we, and then, then we'll talk about why and wrap it all up. What we're going to do, if we can, and Wendy, jump in here and tell me if it's doable or Kathy, uh, we can, can we send the links to the Alan Watts videos out? Because obviously I couldn't show this one. I won't be able to show the next one. Yes, yes, yes. yes. We, could watch. we will send those out to all right. everybody. All right. And what I'm going to ask you yeah. to do is to watch them. Um, there's the one you just saw bits and pieces of you'll recognize. There's another one. It starts out with a, a musical metaphor and a clashing of symbols, and then he goes he goes into this this other thing, which is about how we should live or how we shouldn't live. That's their homework. And that's where I wanted. <laughs> that's your homework, and that's what I wanted to start with uh, next week. So if you've watched it, then um, if we can't play it, then at least you we can reference it. All right. Well, thank okay. you very much. We will let you, you all go. Thank you, over the time. Thank you. Thank you, people. Robbie, thank, you. thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>